If there was an updated uh, news about Rick's status, what would it be? What's the latest news about uh, what's well, happening with him? Yeah, we had to change the cards for legal reasons um, to what you see now just a couple of weeks ago because he's got a hearing on the 5th of December and he in Florida and is a very, there's a strong chance he'll be out in, on the 5th of December. But we can't, we can't give a date of when he'll come out. Technically, it's 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, uh, and we don't want to be seen to be trying to influence the outcome of the hearing. Uh, Florida are very touchy about it. But he uh, basically, he served, he, uh, yeah, so explain, he served, he's off the life sentence. But while he was inside, his, um, his mother and his sister got involved in a, a stolen car ring. And uh, Rick put him in touch with somebody in Florida. So when they when they got when they all got busted, Rick ended up taking the hit for his sister and his mother because he's already on life without parole. So he's like, mm -hmm. I did it from but prison. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about life. So the minute parole. the minute Michigan let him go, Florida hey. Florida sent a bus up to collect him. That was his freedom was going from uh, Michigan yeah. to Florida in a bus. Yeah, but when you speak to him now, he's like. Like he said on the phone call, a massive. He, you know, when I first met him, he was resigned to dying in prison. You know, that he was. You, you wouldn't have thought it when you met him. He's like he was. When I first met him, he gave me the sense of tone for the film because he's an incredibly funny guy, and he's just funny. And he's like, he is the class half full kind of guy that his dad was. He's got it. He's got the optimism. He's like hope. And and, but he was resigned to dying inside. And when things have changed, now when you speak to him, it's like, I thought he was like fun, funny before, but now he's just, he know he can see light at the end of the tunnel and it's, he's like four years, fine, I can do this, I don't care. He gets to see the ocean. What was the story that you wanted to tell and how did your meetings with Rick change the story that you thought you wanted to tell? Um, well, I, I was actually, after 71, I was looking for projects and, and um, I was, I, I put two in development and and um, one of the articles I I came across, I was looking at all kind of things, articles, but one of them was an activist article for uh, about White Boy Rick. And it was a fascinating article, but I passed on it ultimately. To, well, not that it was offered to me, but I, I, I decided not to pursue the rights because I couldn't see a story that I, per that I made a per personal connection with. It was like an incredible informant story, uh, an interesting de drug dealer story, but he's not a kingpin. I mean, he was never, he was a dumb kid. I mean, um, but I didn't make a personal connection to it. I just felt, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't see the movie in it. And then I, but a year later, I was sent a spec script and there were, I was like, oh, White Boy Rick, I'll, I'll read that. It's, you know, <laughs> John Lesher and Jeff Robinoff. And I was already working with John Lesher on something else. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely read that because I know that I read the article. I'll be interested to see what they've done with it. And, um, I loved the father-son relationship, but that was only in it for like four or five scenes. And then it became this sort of voiceover, led, uh, you know, Scorsesean aspiring kind of drug dealer, st informant story all about the, the wild ride. And I, I was like, um, I didn't really connect to that emotionally. I was like, well, I'd be really interested in exploring to see if I can make, I said to Jeff and John, if I can develop with the, the sort of the father and son story all the, to, to all the way through, so we can take the voiceover out that existed and see if the their relationship can be the, the, what binds is the, becomes the through line, the spine of the film. And um, I started to I was doing it for two or three months, and I just couldn't make headway with it because it's just so much story, mm -hmm. and we didn't have at that point we didn't have the rights to the article. I get a phone call <laughs> from Scott Franklin, who works with Darren Aronofsky, his right-hand man, producer. He said, yeah, and I've, got, I've found the project for us because me and Darren have been talking about finding something to do together. And I was like, what is it? And he's like, the white boy Rick project. <laughs> I was like, you know, you're kidding, right? I've been on it for a few months. He's like, you can't, you can't be. I've got the life rights. It's like, what? So it's like, there's three of them out there. And um, I was like, look, I can't, uh, you know, it's a, so... Uh, when I was speaking to Jeff Robinoff and John Lesher, and Jeff really wanted to make the film, I was like, look, the only way I'd, I, I, I can see through it is if the only way I can make a personal connection to it is the theme of an outsider and the father-son relationship. That I've got a personal way into, and I care about it. Like, it's a story I can make my own, I can go with it. 
but I need access. To, I need to go and speak to Rick to see if there is a real movie in that. And um, and in order for that to happen, I think we need to merge the two projects. So we we we, we talked about merging them, and then so I went to see Rick. I lined the queue up. I met him and spent four or five hours with him. And uh, I mean, I think for him at that point, he'd been in 27 years. No, but, and no one had asked him about family. When I started asking him about his family, he was like, what, don't you want to talk about this and that? I was like, well, I've read the article. I, 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 I just want to hear about your sister, your, your father, and your grandparents. And then he became really emotional and it was an incredible four or five hours. It just flew by. And I, I got a sense of the emotion, you know, emotionally how, the emotional story. And, I, and then I was like, okay, I want to do this. Uh, so we, we brokered a marriage between the two projects. One of the ways that you have to find your way through the story is to find an actor who's going to play Rick. And I suspect it took a long time to find Richie. Could you talk about the process, what you were looking for, and how you knew you found it when you met with Richie? Okay, it was, um, it was like a, a year and a half, two year process. Straight away, as soon as I, we were starting to develop it, I was like, we should start a search now, because I've done this before. A show called Top Boy I did for Channel Four, and I had like thirty-eight non-actors in it, and I was a very particular urban London urban story, or even some of the kids in in seventy-one were non-actors. Yeah, I was like, we we should be start up a two-pronged attack to find our Rick. We should be looking at real actors or or you know trained kids and non-actors. So Francine Mazer came on board to be the main casting director, and then. We approached Jennifer Vendetti, who had done, um, who'd cast American Honey, which I thought was wonderfully street cast, and they worked together. And Francine put almost every actor you can imagine from here to Australia, UK, I'm serious, like, like everywhere, to or on tape. And I met a lot of them. And Jennifer combed the streets in various states. I met a couple of actors that turned my head that were amazing, but they're ultimately 19, 20. And I just didn't want us to have to, like, pretend. You know, you want to see a 14, 15-year-old boy in, in, a, in the film, you know. I thought it was important. Um, and also that you could tell, I feel, that like the kids I was seeing hadn't, hadn't lived around African-American kids. You know, it just felt appropriated in a kind of youtube way. And so Jennifer went into Baltimore. They went to one of these particular high schools where it's pretty mixed and a bit rough. And she she talks to the principal and and he kind of heard of it about, about street casting because, you know, they'd cast a lot of the wire was done that way. So Baltimore was not f unfamiliar with that process. And um, as they were walking out of the principal's office, there was this kid waiting because he was in trouble. And he was like, well, you can, you can start with this kid here. And they, he didn't really like him. <laughs> and, and that was Richie who's in the film. When you get Richie cast, he obviously hasn't acted before. What does that mean about getting somebody who's young um, in terms of whatever his family situation is to get him on set for probably a couple months of rehearsals and then shooting and then working with somebody like Matthew? How do you break that down for somebody who's never done that professionally and how do you ease him into that so he's not feeling overwhelmed? Yeah, I mean, it's a process. It's a big old thing. But he was rough. He was raw, like really raw. He had, issue, you know, behavioral issues. Didn't really want to do it. Didn't, didn't understand what it was. Um, I met with him. He came to Cleveland to meet me. I lo I kind of loved him anyway as a kid, but I didn't know if he could do it. I put him on tape, a couple of things. And I was like, okay, I can see something here. So I said to Matthew, look, you know, I, I'm thinking of using a non-actor. And Matthew loved that idea. He was open. You know, you have to remember he was street cast. You know, he was cast out of a bar, you know, phased and confused. He wasn't, he was a non-actor. He was the non-actor on the set that was only supposed to say three lines. And uh, they, they got a kick out of him. So he, <laughs> next thing you know, these parts was kept growing every day, you know, to bring the kid back. So he had, he had a generosity, a spirit towards the kid, towards the idea. But he wasn't, we were, we were being careful not to be hopeful, you know, hopelessly romantic about it because <laughs> you'd have to find someone that could pull it off. So anyway, we brought Math we brought the kid out to do a workshop with Matthew. And I spent a whole day, we worked scenes, we and it was just what was incredible to watch was the effect A how Matthew was with the kid and B the effect it had on Matthew 
because Matthew could come in hot and or had ideas, but you know, he quickly realized, I sort of say to him, look, you know, he can't be in a Matthew McConaughey film because he does, <laughs> he, he can't act. You're gonna have to be in the sort of, yeah. you're gonna be in his, you're gonna have to be in his film, <laughs> and and Matthew just got that and he loved it. And the kid sort of anchored him, so he'd have to like tap dance around what the kid was doing and tune into the kid's frequency and convince us that he is the kid's father, you know? Um, and the way he was pitching things to kid was like fascinating. It was quite enigmatic, and but you know, there was an inner life. Um, he accessed a lot of, he could access a lot of emis- emotion because mm-hmm. he'd been abandoned and stuff. So his own life, in some ways, touched Rick's own life. Yeah, yeah. So then when we cast him, it was there was a boot camp. I got him out for. Fr- I, we needed. I knew I needed to spend some months with him before shooting, mm-hmm. and it was going to be a long shoot because if I took him on and I didn't cast a seventeen or eighteen year old boy, I would only get eight hour days, which means I needed more days. Mm-hmm. So it was going to be a, a, a long shoot. But we and. Uh, very short days, and and I'd have to get him ready for the marathon. Um, so we needed a chaperone, for example, right? So this extraordinary thing happened, took place on the set, on the shoot, because I was making a father-son story with him and Matthew, and then when we were looking for a chaperone, there was no one in his family could do it. You know, they're, they're really poor family, and no one could take time off the work to chaperone him. And he didn't want to come with a hired chaperone from the studio. He didn't. He'd never left. He'd never left his state before, right? So he was, um, so out of the blue, his mother says she'll do it. And he hadn't lived with his mother. His mother left him, left when he was four years old. So they'd been out of contact more or less for yeah. more going, than a decade. Yeah, going through, you know, rehab and stuff and having a very difficult life. And his older brother was in jail. Um, so there's an extraordinary thing that was taking place where there was like, we're making a father son film. And behind the scenes, there's like this mother and daughter, mother and son reconciliation taking place and uh, yeah and he came we got him three months before and i changed his diet and we give him coaching lessons and matthew was like matthew would hang out with him matthew would take him under his wing he'd go bowling with him he'd be and i'd have to be more the paternal figure and matthew would be like he's in the movie he'd be <laughs> he'd be his buddy if the kid misbehaved he wouldn't tell him to behave he'd just like he'd be he'd get involved which was a bit painful at times but <laughs> did the kid even know who matthew was no, no, <laughs> I forgot to say that. I mean, that was that was the most extraordinary bit. Like, he turned up in LA and he just didn't know who Matthew McConaughey was. <laughs> Hadn't even thought of Googling him, just didn't, just not culturally on his radar whatsoever. <laughs> it was amazing. So he was completely unfazed when he met him. Like, yeah, and thank you so much right, for coming and sharing our, your film right. with us.